Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gaël, and uh, bon, bon après-midi à, à tous et à toutes. Um, welcome to this session of the Ottawa People's Commission on the Convoy Occupation. Uh, my name is Alex Neve, and I'm one of the four commissioners uh, serving with the People's Commission, and two of my fellow commissioners are with me this afternoon. They'll introduce their se themselves in a moment. Uh, before we get uh, going, um, there's, uh, there's two things I would very much like to acknowledge uh, before we start the proceedings this afternoon. The first is that um, throughout these, these two months and cert of, of hearings, and certainly this afternoon, uh, we've been conducting these sessions in the um, unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Uh, and uh, and it's, and it's a, a very special honor for us to be able to do that in these lands. Um, and it's uh, particularly um, uh, a, a solemn and serious honor that we're able to do that given the theme, given the topic of, of the People's Commission, which is, uh, as the name implies, is looking into the impact of an occupation of these lands um, during the month of February and what that impact was on the community. Uh, and, uh, and, in, and in thinking about that notion of uh, occupation, we cannot overlook the fact that, of course, these lands have been occupied for long before that. Uh, and that really is an underlying factor and dimension to how we are approaching the People's Commission and, and our understanding of, of what's at stake and the significance of what happened in February. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to very much acknowledge is that we are gathering today on December the 10th, and many of you will likely know that December the 10th is International Human Rights Day, and the, this is the 74th anniversary of the United Nations adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is in many respects the cornerstone of the international human rights system. Uh, there's much that has been built upon the Universal Declaration in the years and decades since. Uh, human Rights Day is, uh, is often a day that feels both celebratory and solemn. Uh, celebratory in that it uh, is an opportunity for us to, uh, to both acknowledge the gains and achievements that have happened over these 74 years, but even more importantly, to celebrate uh, the power of people uh, coming together, mobilizing and taking action and speaking out um, in defense of their rights, in the defense of the rights of other people. It's a solemn day as well though, of course, because I don't need to, I'm sure, remind any of us that as we do gather in 2022, the world is far from uh, being in a state where universally human rights are protected. Uh, quite the contrary, we live in a world full of far too much uh, human rights abuse. It's, in, it's, it's particularly important to take note of this being Human Rights Day because human rights is the, the dimension that, that is at the heart of everything we're hearing and thinking about as we've been going through the Ottawa People's Commission. Uh, because all elements of what happened in Ottawa in February are at their very core uh, all about human rights. That certainly very obviously includes the right to protest, the right to freedom of association, the right to freedom of peaceful assembly, uh, which, uh, which was a right uh, robustly exercised um, uh, by the convoy participants, and a right which I'm sure all of us in the room uh, cherish and, uh, and, and champion, and I'm sure many of us have participated in, in a number of protests over the years. There's a very important wider human rights dimension uh, to what happened in February as well. And uh, along with my colleagues, we've been hearing all about that uh, over the many sessions we've been having of the People's Commission. And that is the rights of people living in the neighborhoods, living and working uh, in the neighborhoods that were directly impacted. 
Uh, and that's, that's really the entire range of rights, you know, perhaps most fundamentally importantly, the right to equality and non-discrimination, uh, but rights uh, related to housing, to health care, uh, earning a livelihood, having access to adequate food, uh, to security of the person and safety. Um, so many rights that were every day imperiled and we've been hearing uh, firsthand from uh, poignantly from many people sharing their experience of those rights abuses. Mm -hmm. So that is the approach that we are bringing to the People's Commission, making sure that um, above all else, we're keeping human rights in mind and adopting a human rights approach and framework uh, to how we assess what the community impact was. Uh, the People's Commission uh, is, as the name suggests, uh, a community level initiative uh, and is very much reflective of the fact that within the impacted communities in Ottawa, in the aftermath of the convoy occupation, it was very clear uh, that this was not over for people, that there were uh, answers people still needed, there was trauma that people were still carrying, and that there was a strong desire and need for justice and accountability uh, that had not been met. And while there are uh, several official processes underway, and uh, we've all, I'm sure, seen the extensive media coverage recently of the Rouleau inquiry, for instance, it became clear that those official processes had very little space to hear from the community. Uh, to hear directly about what the impact and experience of living through the convoy was. And I think for many people that wasn't okay, uh, and that it seemed inadequate and short-sighted not to have a venue that was going to ensure that there was a significant space uh, for members of the community to share their experience. Um, and rather than simply be disgruntled about that, uh, there was energy and determination within the community to do something about it, uh, and thus the creation of the Ottawa People's Commission, uh, and here we are. So th it, is, uh, it is a venue very much for meant to meet those goals, a place for healing uh, uh, in the face of the trauma, a place for justice in the face of that need for accountability, uh, and, uh, and that's what we have very much been hearing from people over the course now of many sessions, both uh, in-person hearings like this afternoon, uh, a number of online sessions where we've been hearing from people, and then also community meetings uh, where rather than hearing uh, individually from, uh, from a series of witnesses, we've had discussions uh, amongst a group of people. And all of that has, has given us a rich array of information. Um, uh, we are going to hear from three people this afternoon, uh, and uh, I think as many of you may know, this is the last of our sessions, uh, and it is, I think, very fitting that our last session is in person, uh, and that is happening on Human Rights Day. Uh, I think both of those give some, uh, some added meaning and, and powerfulness uh, to what we will hear this afternoon. Before we get underway, I'm going to turn to my two colleagues, and I think uh, Debbie awuso Achaya is going to begin, and then uh, Monia Mazig after her. So over to you, Debbie. Excellent. Thank you so much, and hi, everyone. Um, as Alex mentioned, my name is Debbie awuso Achaya. I'm happy to meet you all. Uh, oh, can, can, you, can you hear me? Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Debbie, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm really proud to be joined here with my fellow co-commissioners, we're missing one. Her name is Leilana Farha, she's not here today. Um, but uh, this has been a really, um, really interesting experience, just being able to hear all of the different insights from uh, different communities within the, the Ottawa area, whether they were in the red zone or not. Um, and being a Vanya resident myself, I am super proud of the fact that we are holding this here. Um, and um, I did want to, um, alongside my colleague here, kind of share a little bit about some of the insights we've gotten from Vanya residents about their experience during the um, occupation in February. Um, we heard for already from like a significant number of folks in Vanya and Overbrook, um, both in public and private hearings. Um, we know that while uh, you're some distance away from downtown and Parliament here, uh, Parliament Hill, sorry, nearby residents and businesses were directly affected by the convoy occupation and the staging area and logistics camp that's on Coventry Road. We've heard about the honking horns and toxic fumes, not just from Rideau Street, 
but from the spike in truck traffic down the parkway and through your neighborhoods. We heard about buses being detoured and O-train services uh, disruptions and residents who lost work and wages because stores and job sites were shut down. We've also heard about the threats and the fear that trapped some people in their homes, the concern for many children awaiting their school bus just a few blocks away from that staging area, and the anxiety when an overbooked childcare center was lock on lockdown after calls of a so-called protect the children protest outside their doors. We've heard about the sense of lawlessness as people were verbally assaulted and women had to fend off sexual advances, all the more triggering for those who are survivors of abuse, violence, and trafficking. We've heard about the heightened fear for many in the neighborhood who are francophone, who are indigenous, who are black, who are brown, all confronting hate and harassment and feeling vulnerable and unprotected. Thank you, uh, Debbie. Uh, bonjour. Mon nom c'est Monia Mazik, et euh, je suis euh, autrice et je suis aussi militante pour les droits de la personne. Et euh, je partage ce panel avec euh, mes collègues Alex et Debbie. Euh, c'est très important que nous continuions et que nous finissons nos audiences publiques en français. Euh, ce n'est pas seulement euh, un geste symbolique, mais c'est aussi un geste euh, pertinent parce que euh, Vanier euh, représente une extension du centre-ville, mais aussi une place où beaucoup de Canadiens euh, vivent, parlent français. Et donc, euh, c'est un effort de la part euh, de mes collègues et de moi-même pour euh, vous écouter, pour venir ici dans votre quartier et vous écouter. Alors je vais continuer sur euh, ce que ma collègue Déby a déjà euh, résumé, ce que nous avons déjà entendu et qui nous a été communiqué pendant les autres audiences euh, concernant le quartier de Vanier et concernant aussi Overbrook. On nous a parlé de l'attaque contre un résident de Vanier, travaillant et sans, travailleur essentiel au centre-ville, qui a reçu un coup de poing au visage parce qu'il portait un masque et qui, alors qu'il était soigné dans une ambulance, a été tourmenté par les partisans du convoi qui ont tenté de l'intimider pour qu'il ne porte pas plainte. On nous a parlé de la mère d'un conseiller municipal qui a trouvé une foule hostile de partisans du convoi manifestant devant chez elle. On nous a parlé de la frustration et de la colère lorsque les médias portaient toutes leurs attentions sur les châteaux gonflables sur la rue Wellington, tout en prétendant que le chaos ne touchait pas le centre-ville et l'air du marché. Nous savons que ce sentiment d'oubli et d'abandon n'a fait que s'accentuer lorsque les camions déplacés du centre-ville ont fini par encombrer les rues de vos quartiers ici et de votre euh, place de résidence. On nous a parlé de la Bikers Church qui fournissait de la nourriture, du soutien et un lieu de rassemblement aux partisans du convoi, ce qui a suscité un malaise chez ses voisins. On nous a parlé de la pression exercée sur beaucoup de familles déjà très stressées car elles, étaient car elles étaient divisées entre ceux qui soutenaient les objectifs et les actions du convoi et ceux qui s'y opposaient. Mais on nous a aussi parlé de la force et du soutien des résidents de Vanier et d'Overbrook, à savoir des voisins qui veillaient les uns sur les autres, qui apportaient de la nourriture et qui faisaient des courses pour ceux qui craignaient de quitter leur domicile, des messages sur Facebook pour informer les gens des risques alors que la ville et la police restaient silencieux. Nous sommes donc très heureux de tenir la dernière de nos audiences publiques au centre Pauline Charon, au cœur de Vanier, afin de signaler clairement que nous avons entendu ce que nous avons entendu et que nous vous voyons et que nous vous, en, et que nous, nous engageons à partager vos histoires et à prendre des mesures pour que vos préoccupations soient prises en compte et que vos droits soient respectés si de futures perturbations du type qu'on voit devraient se reproduire. En conclusion, nous tenons à remercier le personnel du centre Pauline Charan de nous avoir accueillis aujourd'hui, ainsi que les dirigeants de l'association communautaire de Vanier, de l'association communautaire d'Overbrook et de la ZAC de Vanier pour leur aide et leur soutien. Merci beaucoup. 
Uh, merci, uh, Monia, et merci, Debbie. Um, je crois que maintenant, nous sommes prêts à uh, commencer la session pour le, cet après-midi. Uh, this is the final of, of several sessions we've had over the course of the fall now. Uh, and um, we've now had the opportunity through, through sessions like this, online sessions and community meetings, to hear from over 150 people. Uh, we've had written submissions from over 75 uh, people, and those are still coming in. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's a great honor for us to have this rich trove of, of information describing people's experiences. Uh, so we are leaving it to the people uh, themselves to identify themselves as they wish. Um, some people, for very understandable reasons, do not necessarily want their name or their full name to be shared publicly, and we respect that. Um, what we can assure the audience is that if people don't share their full name, we ourselves have fully verified people's identity, so you can be confident of that. Um, we're asking people to begin with a short opening presentation, uh, and then um, after that, uh, the commissioners will have um, a number of hearings. Alors, bienvenue à notre premier uh, présenteur, et uh, la parole est à vous. Bonjour. Okay. Um, mon nom est Danielle Maillot. En février 2022, j'habitais le marché Bay à Ottawa sur la rue Clarence, au coin de la rue Cumberland, à quelques rues du centre Rideau. Je suis enseignante de maternelle jardin et première année à la retraite. Je suis ici pour mettre en lumière et, et puis je voudrais commencer par vous remercier pour euh, les cinq minutes que vous m'accordez et puis il me ferait plaisir de répondre à vos questions après ma présentation. Euh, je suis ici pour les enfants, pour mettre en lumière tous les efforts qu'a fait la Commission populaire d'Ottawa pour représenter les opinions euh, biaisées des résidents d'Ottawa. Euh, les résidents, je suis résidente d'Ottawa et euh, les informations que vous avez sur le site Ottawa People's Commission, Commission populaire d'Ottawa, ne devrait, ne devrait pas s'appeler comme ça. Ça devrait s'appeler un autre nom parce que ça ne représente pas l'opinion de tous les gens. Euh, les gens qui travaillent pour la commission ont fait le triage des répondants choisis pour paraître devant la commission. Les personnes qui veulent faire entendre leur voix doivent d'abord compléter un formulaire qui énumère une longue liste d'exemples d'incidents négatifs ou choisir, par exemple, des impacts des manifestants, violence, altercation euh, et harcèlement, euh, vous, euh, euh, et, savoir si les police, et savoir si les répondants ont souffert de l'absence de réponse des policiers. Cette commission n'offre pas même le choix de critères positifs pour le répondant qui a eu une expérience positive. Pour paraître devant vous, j'ai dû choisir des critères qui ne s'appliquaient pas à mon expérience. Mais plus que cela, suite au formulaire, une représentante de la commission m'a téléphoné pour s'assurer que mon témoignage était bel et bien négatif. Euh, ceci explique les titres qui circulent. La Commission populaire d'Ottawa entend parler de la colère et de la frustration suscitées par le convoi. Le peuple canadien et les enfants méritent qu'on leur dise la vérité. Si la Commission populaire fabrique cette situation, les médias la propagent. Aujourd'hui, je tiens les médias personnellement responsables de la tromperie et de la déformation des faits qu'ils ont perpétrés sur le public en ce qui concerne la rétention d'informations et la promotion de discours de haine, y compris les méfaits du masque, du confinement, 
de la distanciation sociale, des tests de PCR, des injections expérimentales, ainsi que des attaques ciblées contre toute voie dissidente, y compris le convoi des, com des camionneurs, les professionnels de la santé et bien d'autres. En vertu de l'article euh, 319 du Code pénal commet une infraction quiconque incite publiquement à la haine ou encourage la haine contre un groupe. On m'a interviewé à trois reprises et à trois reprises, les intervieweurs cherchaient des points négatifs. J'étais fière que la, com la communauté d'Ottawa accueille les camionneurs dans un moment historique. Euh, un autre interview. Peut-être un peu plus lentement pour les traducteurs. Merci. OK, merci. Parce qu'il me reste 51 secondes, est-ce que euh, c'est ça? Ça va, ça va. La vérité, c'est que la Ville d'Ottawa a payé les business des mille et des mille dollars, les a forcés à fermer. C'est la Ville d'Ottawa qui a interdit les toilettes mobiles afin de punir les gens qui voulaient être au centre-ville. Je suis une personne du centre-ville. J'étais sur la colline parlementaire tous les matins. J'ai accueilli les camionneurs. Les camionneurs sont une délégation sont une délégation pour les gens, par les gens. Tous les gens qui étaient sur les viaducs pour accueillir, pour supporter les camionneurs. Les camionneurs, je tiens responsable de son mandat, euh, la Commission populaire d'Ottawa. Et je voudrais remplacer les membres qui sont ici pour avoir une vraie commission qui puisse inclure aussi tous les gens tous les gens qui ne peuvent pas recevoir une transplantation d'organes pour cause d'une inoculation qu'ils n'ont pas pris, qu'ils ont perdu leurs emplois. Ma famille est divisée. Les gens ne me parlent plus. C'est inacceptable. Alors, il faudrait écouter aussi tous ceux qui n'ont pas eu d'opération dans les deux dernières années. Il faudrait écouter tous les gens qui ont qui sont heureux d'avoir accueilli le, le convoi, parce que le convoi, c'était une délégation. Et les protestations sont légales. Daniel, euh, j'aimerais oui. juste vous... Merci pour votre euh, témoignage, mais j'aimerais vous rappeler que les audiences de la Commission euh, publique populaire euh, d'Ottawa, c'est de parler de l'impact... Oui, je peux parler de ça. C'est en dehors de notre mandat je peux de parler voir de l'impact. De, 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 je peux parler de l'impact. Mais vous ne l'avez pas fait. Je vais en parler tout de suite. C'était la première répondre, fois en deux répondre, ans. Peut-être répondre, peut-être répondre aux questions de mes collègues, mais euh, malheureusement, pendant les cinq minutes, vous n'avez pas parlé de l'impact sur votre propre personne ou sur votre entourage. L'impact était qu'en deux ans, c'était la première fois que j'avais un peu d'espoir dans la communauté d'Ottawa. C'était la première fois que j'avais arrêté. Je faisais une maîtrise en éducation sur la pensée algébrique à cinq ans. J'étais interdite d'entrer dans les écoles pour faire mes expérimentations. J'ai dû abandonner ma maîtrise. Et puis, en plus de ça, je ne pouvais plus me concentrer parce que je savais que tout ce qui se passait, c'était complètement illégal, non constitutionnel, non fondé sur la Constitution. Je sais très bien que le gouvernement n'avait aucun droit légal de sortir les, euh, les euh, protestations. J'avais peur que, des Est-ce que vous avez écrit, est-ce que vous avez partagé euh, votre... Euh, frustration, votre euh, euh, désaccord avec le gouvernement? J'ai pris des photos de tous les policiers qui ont occupé la ville après le départ des camionneurs. À chaque endroit où il y avait 6, 7, 10, 20 policiers qui bloquaient les rues, j'ai été la première à qui on a demandé mon adresse avant d'entrer sur avant d'avoir accès à Riverside, pourquoi est-ce qu'on a fermé toutes les voies d'accès jusqu'à Parkway? Parce que moi, j'avais besoin d'aller sur Nicolas, et puis là, il y avait quelqu'un qui me demandait mon adresse. J'ai dit, non, je n'ai pas besoin de donner mon Ça, adresse. Quand? Ça, c'était quand? Ça, c'était pendant que les policiers ont bloqué les rues. Donc, ça, c'était après l'occupation? Non. 
la Pendant... délégation des camionneurs était encore en ville. La délégation... Est-ce que vous avez une date? Ah, oh, j'ai deux ou trois dates. Toutes les oui. fins de semaine que vous avez fermé, les... que les policiers ont fermé toutes les artères pour se rendre en ville. Je ne pouvais même pas entrer. Il a fallu que je monte mon adresse parce qu'ils n'auraient même pas accepté que je retourne sur Clarence. C'est oui, inacceptable. Est-ce est que, est -ce que vous avez une date? Quand est-ce que vous... Parce que vous avez je dit quand le... les camionneurs je... sont partis. Non, ce n'était pas quand les camionneurs... Ah, J'ai pris des photos quand les camionneurs sont partis parce que les policiers ont pris la, le centre-ville. Ont, euh, ont pris le centre-ville. Mais... Euh, J'ai pris toutes des photos de tous les policiers qui ont, bloqué les, euh, qui ont bloqué ma rue. Et moi, je suis victime de violences domestiques. Je suis victime de violences domestiques. J'ai toujours appuyé les policiers. Puis, ce n'était pas nos policiers d'Ottawa, je ne crois pas en tout cas, qui ont fait ça à notre population. Je pense qu'ils ont importé des Mais est-ce que vous pensez que les camionneurs sont tous d'Ottawa? Ils sont aussi venus, euh, c'est-à-dire que c'est la même chose? Non, je parle de moi. Moi, j'ai été victime de violences domestiques et j'ai toujours appuyé les policiers. Pendant le, les camionneurs, non? Non, 25 ans passés. D'accord. Mais ce que j'ai vécu maintenant, je détestais. Les... J'ai vu des policiers du Québec qui ont poussé les gens. Moi, j'étais là. Moi, je me suis fait pousser. Puis, à part de ça, ils ont mesuré mon visage. Vous avez été poussé par les policiers? Euh, non, je ne peux pas dire ça, mais j'étais là quand ils ont avancé sur les gens. Puis, je pouvais lire « Policiers du Québec ». Puis... Non, ça, c'était juste en dernier, quand les, ils ont importé des policiers. Do you have any question, Alex or Debbie? Uh, merci okay. pour ça. Um, peut-être nous avons quelques... Uh, J'ai peut-être deux, trois questions. Uh, D'abord, je veux vous assurer que uh, nous sommes ouverts à tous les points de vue concernant le convoi et que certainement nous avons entendu des autres gens qui soutiennent le convoi. Euh, C'est pas Pourquoi vrai. Est-ce que votre formulaire est, ne est, dit pas ça? Est-ce que je peux Monsieur finir? Merci. Euh, euh, le, le fait que dans les formulaires, il y a beaucoup de questions sur le impact euh, négatif, c'est parce que nous avons une, une approche des droits humains. Pour, Mais alors, pour, alors, je ne suis pas fini. Euh, pour, euh, euh, et pour bien entendre et comprendre l'impact euh, des droits humains, nous devons euh, comprendre l'expérience négative des gens. Euh, ce n'est pas vrai que, que nous screen out euh, les gens qui, sont, euh, des, euh, qui soutiennent euh, le convoi. Nous avons entendu plusieurs de, de témoins qui sont vraiment des, des gens qui soutiennent le convoi. Nous a, il y avait deux sessions euh, seulement pour les gens qui soutiennent euh, le convoi. Alors, je veux... Euh, je vous a, a, assure que ce n'est pas vrai que nous sommes euh, contre le convoi. Notre mandat est simplement, comme ma collègue a souligné, l'impact du convoi, l'impact, l'impact négatif ou positif. Et nous avons entendu plusieurs fois des gens qui décrivent pour eux un impact positif. Um, mais c'est cette question, l'impact du convoi. Nous, nous ne sommes pas ici pour avoir un débat sur la science des vaccins, uh, les protocoles de, de santé Moi publique. OK. C'est seulement cette question d'impact public. Et nous avons entendu que pour vous, vous dites que c'était positif parce que c'était la première fois que, que vous avez... Euh, eu un sens d'espoir. Euh, et nous avons entendu ça et nous allons écrire ça dans, euh, dans nos, euh, euh, nos notes et, et c'est bien entendu. J'ai seulement une question. 
Um, Est-ce que um, vous étiez là dans, uh, sur la colline et, uh, plusieurs fois mm -hmm. uh, pendant le mois de février? Uh, Est-ce que, est que vous avez um, uh, compris qu'il y avait aussi, je comprends que pour vous, c'était un impact positif, mais est-ce que vous avez compris que pour beaucoup d'autres gens, uh, il y avait aussi un impact négatif? Et est-ce que c'était quelque chose de troublant pour vous? Non, pas du tout. Parce que... Euh, parce que parce qu'on dirait qu'on oublie qu'Ottawa, c'est une ville où on accueille les gens qui ont besoin de s'exprimer. Et puis, ce n'est pas vrai que votre formulaire n'est pas discriminatoire. J'aimerais vraiment que votre formulaire soit passé, parce que moi, je, les questions sont biaisées. Il n'y a aucune place pour écrire rien de positif. Votre formulaire devrait être placé à la vue de tous. Mais vous êtes là parmi nous et vous êtes en train de dire oui. ce que vous voulez dire, donc on ne voit pas pourquoi vous pensez oui, que c'est discriminatoire. Oui, il y avait plusieurs d'autres gens euh, avec des opinions très positives du convoi qui Mais étaient devant nous. pourquoi est-ce que votre formulaire okay. ne comprend pas autant... Nous, pour la parole des gens qui la ont preuve, quelque chose de La preuve, vous êtes là aujourd'hui et vous êtes en train été... de parler et non, de dire ce que vous voulez. OK, nous avons entendu que, que des vous... Des mensonges. Okay. J'ai été obligée de dire oui, c'est vrai. Donc vous, tout ça. donc, vous admettez que vous avez menti pour venir ici? J'ai dit... La seule chose que j'ai dit, parce que j'essayais vraiment de ne pas mentir, c'est qu'il y avait de la fumée. Sur la rue King Edward. Okay. Nous ne sommes pas ici pour avoir un débat du formulaire. Je suis d'accord. Euh, mais certainement, vous êtes ici, vous n'êtes pas la première euh, personne qui soutient le convoi qui était devant nous. Alors, nous sommes ouverts à tous les points de vue. Merci pour être ici cet après-midi. Et je vous remercie. Euh, J'espère juste que la Commission populaire d'Ottawa va avoir une deuxième commission avec toute la vérité. C'est ça que j'espère vraiment. Okay. Pas de mensonges. OK. Merci. Merci euh, nous sommes prêts maintenant pour euh, le pro la prochaine présentation. Uh, I'm actually one of the workers from Parliament Hill. We lost three weeks of income. We were not eligible for EI. We were not eligible for any help from our union just because there was no precedent for that situation. Um, I've had coworkers who I don't even know how they did it because they had little kids to feed. When you don't have income coming in for nearly a month, how are you supposed to do that? We had another, even once we were allowed to go back to work, we had one coworker who the boss had to lend him money just so he could put gas in his truck to come in to, and work for the week. The situation was ridiculous. I've had multiple friends who live downtown who were assaulted, harassed. It's, it's kind of incredible to me that the police were just out there giving snacks. And don't get me wrong, you have a right to protest. Had they done it just for a long weekend? Whatever. But three weeks holding an entire neighborhood under siege is too fucking much. That's a whole three weeks of people who had to live with that. I had to go down there due to appointments because of course I scheduled them close to my work. And I'm hard of hearing and I found it to be incredibly loud. I don't know how people who actually live there dealt with it all day every day. And speaking of surgeries, um, I did wind up needing a surgery and due to the spike in cases because of the trucker rally, I had to be awake. They couldn't sedate me safely because I'd had COVID within a certain time frame. So now I deal with that. Do you know what it's like to hear someone drill into your bones? Like I do now. I didn't have the option for general anesthesia, so I'm dealing with that now. I still fucking remember it. I guess a mild case of PTSD from that. And I probably would have never caught COVID if it weren't for that spike of cases. Because it would have been late March, so just after they left, pretty much. So all in all, I had a very bad time with it. 
And one of my coworkers has a wife who worked at the Shepherds of Good Hope while it was all happening. She said the amount of overdoses they had to deal with were through the roof. And it wasn't their usual homeless people. It was people out there partying. Like, what a waste of resources. And on top of it, I had to live with one of them. Like, the guy had no respect for me. Like, I, I don't understand. Actually, I do. Basically, I think the, the biggest thing this whole pandemic has taught people is that most people are too medically illiterate to understand what they're even being told. That's the only way I can explain this, because anyone who understands anything would understand why we're doing certain things. And I still don't understand how three years later, most, pe most of these people haven't bothered to like, educate themselves at all. Like, how do you still go through all of this and have no understanding of how any of this works? It's not complicated. But I have yet to see anyone face any real consequences yet? Like, what is that? Like, is our legal system just a joke? Because I'm pretty sure multiple people have violated their probation orders and been in Ottawa. I haven't heard of any real consequences for any of them. That's about all I have to say. All right, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, uh, Debbie, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for sharing um, your experience. And I'm sorry to hear about the, the health issues you had to navigate on top of the world navigating uh, a global pandemic. Um, I'm very curious, you mentioned something very briefly, and it's the first I've heard of it, and I don't know if my mm -hmm. colleagues have heard this too, about your, your colleague's spouse who was working at the Shepherds of Good Hope yes, and the uh, spike in overdoses that were not related to their clientele. No, the, she basically, because they have their regulars, right? They're mm -hmm. the same people who are always down there who are homeless. During the trucker rally, they actually scattered and disappeared. They don't really know where all of them even went. They just hid. And that spike in overdoses was truckers. It was the same ones who would also go there and like basically threaten them into giving them food. That was another thing they were dealing with. Okay. That and I think did make the news. Did it make the so news? I think made so, the news? yes. Okay, okay. Good to know. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Mona, do you have any questions? Actually, I was very interested in the same topic as well because we never heard about this, so it is really important. Yeah. Uh, this is something we would love to explore maybe among each other later on. Um, so thank you for bringing this to our attention uh, about the uh, number of overdose exploding um, and apparently, like you have said, from the truckers. Um, yeah. We heard about the regular disappearing somehow. We heard mm. about that, yes. Oh, but we didn't they ran. hear. Yes, we actually we don't know what happened to the homeless. Mm. It's still something, but it was brought to our attention through different several um, um, uh, testimonies. Um, if I would like. I don't know how comfortable you are. I, I would like to bring you back again to the surgery, mm -hmm. you said. Yes. Um, um, would you like to... So did you have surgery during No, the it was... I am... Um, basically, right after the trucker rally, a lot of us got COVID for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. And then not long after that, I injured myself, and we were discussing my options. They were not comfortable putting me under general anesthesia because they weren't sure I'd keep breathing because I'd been infected so recently. Okay. So I had to be awake with local anesthesia and Okay. okay. So it's this like an is alien something abduction, the basically. doctors <laughs> decided to do, right? Yes. Because of your for your safety. Yes. Okay. It's it was basically like something out of a horror movie when you get abducted like by an alien. That's how I would describe it. it is yes. and I had to go through that for basically other people's entertainment for three weeks. Okay, I think that's all I have, Alex. Thank you. Um, I was uh, actually I, I had a couple of questions. I, I want to go back to what you referenced at the beginning, mm -hmm. which was you, you indicated that you had you had been working. Yes, I was um, working on Parliament Hill Parliament as part Hill. of the Center Block project. Okay, so that was uh, construction related work. Yes. Uh, okay. And um, and then and then that stopped and, oh, and you absolutely. had no salary. Can you just maybe um, give us a little bit more 
it was background considered, as to what happened. It was considered too dangerous for most of us to go in. I know a small skeleton crew had to go in just due to basic safety of the building in case something flooded or caught fire because normal systems are down while we're doing our stuff. Um, but no, they wouldn't let the full crew go in because it was deemed unsafe. And also, I think they were partially worried we may or may not instigate something ourselves as well as a countermeasure. Uh, we were actually told by our employer if we were caught either with the convoy or even just in a counter protest, if they saw us on camera, we were fired. It, they didn't care what side. They're like, You're, we had to remain completely neutral and stay home, otherwise our employment was at risk. Was your employer the federal government or were you working for a company? I'm not sure that was how high up that order went, mm -hmm. but at the same time, do you really want your workers out there embarrassing you like that? Mm -hmm. Especially on such a prominent site with a lot of media around it. It's not a good look, and I understand why they said that. So, how long were you off of work? Three weeks, and we were not eligible for EI. There was nothing set up for our circumstance. The, we completely fell through the cracks, no one had anything for us. And even now, 10 months later, you've not been reimbursed for those? Oh, absolutely not. And after the three weeks, three weeks, did you go back to work? Or was yes, that the end we of it? were guaranteed that we would have our jobs back if we did, for example, go work temporarily for someone else, or if we did somehow manage to get EI, which a few of my coworkers managed, but I'm not sure how. I guess they just got lucky and slipped through, and no one noticed that they were off of work due to that. Mm -hmm. And so did you, um, in the early days, were you still working when, when the, the convoy had begun to assemble or, or was it pretty well immediate that you um, stopped working? I remember Friday they sent us home a little bit early because there was starting to be okay. too, mu too many people showing up. Right. Um, most people were not prepared. They thought it was going to last a few days at most. So you weren't working at the time the convoy was in full swing. Oh, God, no. They wouldn't okay. let us in. Right. Even if we did show up, they wouldn't let us in. Okay. Uh, did you ever go down yourself? Uh, only due to appointments that I had downtown that I had made pre-convoy. And, for example, my dentist is downtown near my work for convenience purposes. So and that was fun. And did you have any difficulty reaching the appointments? Uh, yes. A lot of streets were closed off. Um, they were a little hesitant to let people into the building unless you really had an appointment, obviously, for reasons, because uh, even, even my dentist and his staff had been harassed as well, actually. We uh, chatted a bit about it while I was in for my appointment. Right. Yeah. They, uh, they had an interesting time getting to work themselves. So. All right, well, thank you. Those are my questions. It's, yeah, that's good. All right, well, thank you for sharing that with us this afternoon. Thank you. All right, we are ready to resume, um, and um, as, as the audience has, has signaled, I think everyone's aware of who's joined us as our final witness, not only for the afternoon, but for these sessions. And, um, and it's, it's, it's very helpful for us to have this opportunity to hear from Catherine McKenney. Uh, who I can assure you, uh, your name has come up frequently during the course of our sessions because many people have referenced the, the vital role you were playing for people in the community. Um, I think it's safe to say a lot of people have described what you were doing in many respects as, as the only lifeline they had um, uh, throughout those, those difficult three and a half weeks. So we're, we're very aware, Catherine, that you have um, a very unique um, and, and I think wide-ranging perspective, which I know will be really helpful to us. Um, uh, I'm sure you're uh, aware of what the Ottawa People's Commission is all about. Um, there's a lot of reviews going on these days, and, and you've, of course, engaged with others. Um, ours is very uniquely focused uh, on what was the impact of the convoy on the community. And as we've noted, uh, including earlier today, before you arrived, we recognize that for some community members, that may be a positive impact. Um, people have shared with us uh, shared that with us as well. Um, but we also know and have heard extensively uh, from many members of the community um, uh, quite the opposite. 
And um, I guess the, the, the last thing I'll, I'll say to just set things up is throughout uh, this, we are very much trying to take, uh, well, not trying to take, we are taking a human rights approach uh, to how we assess things, which is to really ground this in the community's experience uh, and, um, uh, and the kinds of human rights harms uh, which were right across the board uh, that people were uh, going through. So I, I believe you know uh, my two colleagues, uh, Monia and Debbie, um, uh, but, uh, and, and our fourth colleague who isn't with us uh, this afternoon is Leilani Farha. And uh, we welcome you. And uh, the way we roll is that we invite um, uh, presenters to, to make a, a brief opening presentation. Uh, and then we always, and I'm sure I can assure you, we will for you have some follow-up questions. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, holding this commission, Alex, Monia, Debbie, um, Leilani, who's not here, certainly. Uh, one of the key things missing from what we experienced last uh, last winter, uh, last February, was people's voices. And uh, so my name is Catherine McKenney. I um, I'm a resident of Somerset Ward. At the time uh, that the convoy arrived and occupied uh, parts of our city, I was the city councillor for Somerset Ward. Somerset Ward includes uh, Center Town, West Center Town, and uh, Le Breton Flats. Um, I want to start by saying that I live actually in West Center Town, so I'm a, approximately a, a kilometer away from where what you might describe as the epicenter of the occupation occurred. Red I'm, zone sometimes. The red, red zone, people. yes. Uh, so I, I did not live uh, in the red zone. I was not, uh, I was not a resident of Somerset Ward. Uh, the uh, convoy arrived January 28th, as you, we all know. Uh, we knew it was coming for quite some time. It was evident through um, media reports, certainly social media reports. We, uh, by we, I mean myself and, and residents that I represented at the time. Um, you know, had uh, concerns about what we were hearing. Uh, it arrived, uh, it, um, the, the convoy arrived, the trucks came into, uh, at that point, mostly the downtown. Uh, the, you know, the key concern at the time was that they were uh, directed to park on um, Queen Elizabeth Driveway, which was very surprising to the people who lived downtown. And uh, they just set up on mostly on Kent, O'Connor Bank, and uh, and Wellington. We expected that they would leave on Monday, as we were told. Um, I'm not. I shouldn't say we expected. We were told they would leave on Monday. Um, and uh, so most people, myself included, stayed home for the weekend. Uh, they did not. Most many left, uh, but the uh, the people who stayed behind uh, were more entrenched. And every weekend, uh, the numbers would swell. And uh, it was on the weekends that people, myself, I was uh, down in uh, the red zone almost every day, uh, felt very unsafe. Uh, I was hearing from people daily, hundreds, uh, about their fears, about their experiences, what was happening to them. Um, on the weekends, it became uh, more precarious as people who mostly sympathized with, uh, with the people who were in our city uh, came in and, uh, and caused what uh, we experience as just more violence, more harassment uh, in, in the downtown. Um, again, I went down into the uh, red zone almost every day, and while I was cautious, uh, it was not where I felt most at risk. Uh, it was mostly walking home, so walking home down Lisger or walking home down Cooper, O'Connor, uh, Somerset, uh, where, again, we had people who would come into our city who were quite sympathetic to the people who were occupying it. And uh, often that's where you know, I, I had been accosted or, you know, um, 
Uh, certainly, uh, it was, you know, where uh, vehicles were erratic, driving erratically, and um, uh, so that, uh, that caused the, the greatest concern for, for many, many residents. So, as we all know, I'll wrap up and, and take your questions, but as we all know, it, uh, it ended three and a half weeks later, um, and I would say that outside of fear um, and bewilderment, uh, the greatest sentiment that I heard was that uh, people in um, Ottawa and across the city, I received hundreds of emails from across the city, across the country really, but across the city, felt abandoned. They felt abandoned by their city, certainly by their police services, uh, by all levels of government, and they felt that nobody was giving a voice to what they were experiencing. And on top of what they were experiencing, uh, that was uh, that was very difficult. So again, I thank you for this because it does uh, provide that voice for what people experience. Great, thank you very much for that, and 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 I'm sure we will have some questions. So thank you, uh, Debbie. Do you want to start us off? Yes. So, as my colleague mentioned, your name has come up a lot in um, many of the testimonies that we've heard, um, especially when we spoke around or asked questions around people's engagement with both like the bureaucracy uh, of city. And so you were providing a very interesting lens as someone who was an elected official who was having to field those responses. You had a staff team who was hearing this. Um, I guess I have two questions, and I don't know how much you can share now because they're technical, and I don't even know if the City of Ottawa would give us this information. But do you actually have a number of how many emails and phone calls you were actually receiving from residents? Because um, the quantitative amount is something that I'm interested in. Um, but then also, the insight from your perspective as a counselor if you felt abandoned by the city mm -hmm. and felt abandoned by your colleagues. Um, I, that's two questions I have for you that I'm very, very curious about. Well, thank you for that. Um, I don't have uh, an exact number. I, it's there. It's all been handed over to the um, public order and to mm -hmm. the uh, Emergency Act and to the, over to that inquiry. Uh, but uh, between phone calls, text messages, uh, emails to my home, to my cell, to my office. Uh, five of us, myself and four staff, worked seven days a week. Um, we responded to everyone. Uh, we tried to present a, a statement at least once a day on what was happening and what we could share with people. So much was a cut and paste, but even then, uh, the, the amount of... Uh, information and, and um, messages that I was receiving uh, took five of us. Uh, we never once uh, took a day off. I never once took 15 minutes off. I went to bed and I got up early every morning and that's uh, how five of us. So if that helps to quantify it mm -hmm. in a way, um, you know, that, uh, that was our, our experience. Um, my colleagues, yes, yeah, so I had uh, very strong support from some of my colleagues, certainly uh, my colleagues who share the, you know, the downtown, um, you know, Sean Menard, Jeff Leeper, uh, Ralston King certainly uh, were, were always uh, available. They would join me on safety walks that we tried to organize in the... Uh, in the uh, in, in center town in the red zone, or just outside of the red zone, rather we did not do safety walks in it, but just outside. Um, you know, I had other colleagues, Catherine Kitts, who I felt was genuine when she reached out to me and offered to do whatever she could, help me respond to emails or answer phone calls. Um, it was difficult to coordinate anything like that, but I knew that it was genuine. She wasn't looking for any attention, public attention. Um, I never once received a, a phone call uh, from the mayor of uh, the city. I never once received a phone call from the chief of police. And um, I did receive a, a phone call from the mayor's chief of staff um, the weekend prior to it ending, the, the weekend that we had um, the Battle of Billingsbridge. And uh, told me that they were working on something and asked me if I 
would support having the uh, large vehicles moved off of residential streets? I said yes. Uh, uh, what they asked was that I would allow uh, council, which was, um, which was uh, planned for that Monday to be pushed to Tuesday. I said sure, and they asked me if I would not call for Chief Slowly's resignation, and I was never going to call for Chief Slowly's resignation. I didn't know where that came from, but those were the, the two caveats that they provided. Uh, and they told me I would see any statement. They wouldn't give me any detail uh, 20 minutes before any of my colleagues or it went out. The next day was we were all down on billings. Um, it was very cold. I got the text from the chief of staff, Serge Arpan, saying, "I just sent you. Uh, I just sent you the email that's going out, which with the detail." Um, I hit. I said, "I'm looking now, and my phone actually died." I had a reporter with me, so I, that can be verified. Uh, two hours later, when I got back to the car and plugged it in, is when I learned that the, uh, the deal had been made with Tamara Leach. Uh, one of my colleagues called me, uh, Catherine Kitts, and texted me actually and said she was very surprised that I would agree to that. Um, anyway, hmm. called her back and said I had never agreed to it, but uh, that in fact my phone had died and I had no idea until uh, about 20 minutes before that. So that is the only time that uh, the mayor or his office reached out to me and it was really to try and drag me into what mm -hmm. I felt was a bit of a trap. Okay, so from what I'm hearing, because we do remember that happening where the mayor mm -hmm. had negotiations with uh, the convoy occupiers, you were never brought in as the councillor who oversees the red zone at all as part of being consulted on what to offer and what to That's receive correct. in return. Okay. Thank you. Actually, um, that morning, and uh, I did have a reporter with me all that day, uh, that morning, uh, Matthew Fleury and I actually reached out and asked for a briefing, and we were uh, denied that. So we had no idea what the, the deal uh, okay. was with, uh, with Ms. Leach. Thank you. Um. I have a question. Uh, as, a, as a city councillor or former city councillor, um, you must be aware of um, usually like any emergency kind of plan of whenever the city um, is facing either natural catastrophe mm -hmm. or something. Um, do you know if why that plan was not activated? Yeah, again, that's a very good question. I actually worked for uh, Steve Kanellakis for six years. Um, I was his chief advisor for six years. Uh, he was the deputy city manager at the time, and he was responsible for uh, emergency services. So I will say this, that the city is actually, you know, has a very strong uh, emergency response team, emergency control. Uh, but what happens is depending on what the emergency is, if it's mm. uh, a health emergency, public health leads it. If it's a police emergency, the police lead it. In this case, police were leading it. Um, so as far as the city's responsibility to uh, approach this emergency in, in terms of their uh, emergency response, I would say this, that um, it would seem, this was a, a different type of emergency. This was an emergency that didn't, it wasn't like, um, a, a tornado or a flood where it happens and then you know you respond while it's happening but it, it ends quickly and then you respond mm -hmm. after it's mm -hmm. it's over this was something very different something that we had never experienced in our city where uh, we had a convoy come in stay and then occupy so there was no there was there was no cleanup, if you will. There was no response to people's needs uh, in the same way that you would get through a, a natural disaster. Um, it did occur to me that you know people ha were being left in that area. Um, you know, people's mental health was suffering. Um, you know, but. I'll be honest with you, I didn't know what the answer was in terms of response from public health. Like, it just was not a, a safe place for people to come into. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it would have been probably difficult to just go in and knock on people's doors. It, people were on edge. People were nervous. Uh, people weren't asking me for anyone to come to their door. People were asking for it to be to be over, for there to be a reaction to it, for police to uh, do their jobs um, and to, to move it on out. Nobody was asking me for public health to come and, and check on them. They were after, when it was over. Uh, you know, uh, we needed that kind of response after, and, and we got it to some degree. I have another question. One of the, actually, comments that we heard uh, through over those hearings um, is the lack of information mm -hmm. from the city um, of Ottawa, but also from other, probably, uh, services or department, like public health. Um, how can you explain that, mm -hmm. or do you have any uh, answer? I had the same question, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you know, we did what we could to provide as much information as we could. I know that, you know, again, once a day. Well, before the convoy arrived, I had sent out a statement and shared that with mm -hmm. residents that I represent. Um, and then once, you know, the once it happened, once they were here, things changed almost daily. Mm -hmm. So information that was coming out from my office, uh, people did uh, appreciate that. It, it gave them a sense of, well, first that someone was listening and, and, and that someone was acknowledging what they were experiencing. But um, no, I, I can't tell you why police, why anybody, any other level of government, any other, whether it's the mayor or any the province, uh, didn't provide the, the type of information that people needed at the time. It was very difficult. It was difficult for all of us. Maybe before, last thing. Um, this is not a question or you, the word of abandoned and mm -hmm. abandonment came many, many times. As a city councillor, did you feel even yourself abandoned by maybe some of your other colleagues, some of, you know, other politician? Because we heard this abandonment among the population. Mm -hmm. But um, I felt that people have been abandoned. I felt that an entire neighborhood had been abandoned. And it was, it... Um, it was shocking that no one, uh, whether it was at the federal level, the province, our municipal government, our police, could protect one neighborhood in an entire country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, did I feel abandoned? Not necessarily. I, you know, I, I felt, I, but I knew that people were abandoned. I knew that that Ottawa. Um, and I know the red zone was in Centertown. I know there were other areas also in, in Vanier and, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, where, where they had staging areas that were also, you know, difficult for people. And I knew that people felt abandoned. Uh, thanks so much, Catherine. Uh, yes, I do have a few questions as well. Uh, but thank you for this. It's very helpful. Um, we, we've been reminded many times, and we're, we're all aware of the fact that you know, we are the nation's capital, um, and, and you were representing the downtown core, uh, protest and big events and disruptive protest and big events mm -hmm. uh, are quite commonplace. Uh, and um, and that, that that necessarily has, has impact. It's, it's going to be inconvenient, et cetera. Um, this may seem like a self-evident question, but had you ever seen anything even remotely like this before? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, we, we are used to protests. I've been part of those protests. <laughs> I probably will be again. Uh, we've had protests from people who are also sympathetic to what happened. Um, we had the Rolling Thunder. We had almost... Every Saturday down Elgin Street, you know, people with the same type of sentiment uh, walk down Elgin Street with flags, not. The difference here was the um, w was th these large vehicles taking root, and and um, 
you know, so have I ever seen anything? You know, we've seen some, you know, slow rolls through the downtown, whether it's tractors and whatnot, but we've never, ever seen anything where, um, where the, the streets were actually occupied, where it seemed almost impossible to move very large trucks. Um, and, you know, it, nobody knew or nobody could give us an answer as to whether, um, you know, any of those trucks had been, um, uh, you know, any, any of the uh, had been looked into. Like, did they know what was uh, inside the trucks? They were up on Wellington. They were in front of Parliament. But what was most shocking was that, you know, it 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 also, you know, stretched into a residential neighborhood. And we're used to because it is capital city. Um, this protest was a protest against the federal government. Um, and, but it, it, was the, it was the impact on the residential neighborhood that nobody seemed aware. Uh, I found it absolutely shocking that nobody seemed aware that there was such a dense neighborhood yeah. in such close proximity to parliament. And quite frankly, Wellington was never my concern. I was a city councillor, and my concern was always the residents that I represent. Other people had concern for Parliament and, and Wellington, uh, but my concern was always for residents. And in, in that sense, they, they were completely uh, abandoned. Um, Nobody was in. Uh, nobody was in that residential area. And nobody was acknowledging what was happening in the residential area. So, from that perspective, I'd never seen anything, even remotely like like mm. what we saw last uh, last February. That that reference to you know this this sense that a lot of people didn't realize uh, how densely populated and how residential downtown Ottawa is. Um, I, 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 that resonates with me as well. I'm wondering, as, as someone who represented that area for a number of years, two terms, right? Yes. Um, how would you describe uh, that neighborhood? Mm -hmm. uh, what's its makeup? What, what, are the, the, what is the diversity and, and the people of Centertown? Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it is dense. It is uh, mostly... Um, high-rise, uh, residential. Uh, there is some, you know, low-rise, uh, ground-oriented um, housing. There's some townhomes. There's some older, um, you know, more heritage, um, you know, three-story uh, red brick buildings that, uh, that line, you know, Metcalf and, uh, and Kent Street. Uh, so it's, it's a combination. It's, uh, it is, also um, socioeconomically quite diverse. It's uh, uh, racially diverse. Um, you know, there are um, families as well as seniors, um, as well as uh, many people who are single uh, living in, in that part of the downtown. So it, it really is, it really, there is, um, you know, uh, there, there, there's a school. There was a school that had to be shut down. There's a high school not very far from there that, uh, you know, felt also abandoned. I ran into a teacher not long ago who was still shocked that, you know, they were left alone with all of these children, um, and uh, no, um, no sense that they were even being acknowledged that uh, they had children in these schools. So. You know, it's a it's a, a neighborhood like any other, and I think that that sometimes, if you don't live there, if you're not from Ottawa, maybe uh, you think of you know Ottawa as the capital city and its parliament, but uh, um, you know, twenty three thousand people live um, in and around Center Town, so it's uh, there are a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to pick up on the word abandoned as well. You used it several times, and and um, uh, and both of my colleagues have asked you about it as well. And, and as they've noted, it is. I, I I don't think there's a session we've had mm -hmm. when it hasn't been front and center uh, yeah. in people's testimony, and it's and it's often some of the most emotional part of the testimony. Um, it's it. It, it's a word that we can kind of use easily, but I think in this context it feels 
it feels particularly significant. And I, I guess I'm, I'd be really interested as, as, a, as a political figure, uh, as, as a politician who was representing that community at the time, uh, why should that sense of abandonment be of concern to us? Yes, that, uh, that is key to, to what happened to people. Um, we had very large, what started as a protest in the form of a convoy, large vehicles, then took root, became an occupation. And in an entire country, again, we had a neighborhood that could not be protected. One neighborhood that see that, uh, no level of government, uh, no police force uh, seemed ready to, certainly willing to or able to um, uh, defend, able to uh, come in and, and, and help. Uh, so, it, you know, it's our, our reality was, was shaken. We realized um, that, you know, this could happen again, it could happen anywhere. Um, and if we don't have the correct response to, you know, if we don't, if we don't have the correct response, if we don't pay attention to what's happening and what's coming, we all knew what was coming. And if we don't, um, you know, if we don't turn around and look at the effect that it's having on, on people, and if we don't try to understand why it happened, and, and I wouldn't mind just speaking very briefly to that, if, if you wouldn't mind. While I don't sympathize with the sentiment or the reasons why um, the convoy came into Ottawa, I will say this, I've, and I've said it before, the trucker from Saskatchewan or Coal Lake, Alberta, who left on Monday, wasn't coming in with, with swastikas and wasn't coming in to harass, harass women on the street or people on transit, or people in the grocery store. I don't agree why they came, and I don't agree with their method, but they left. People who were left behind, well, again, I do not agree with the, the sentiment and, and what they represented. I will say this, that you know, I went down many days and I tried to ask them to leave. So I spent time talking to people, and almost everyone, um, was poor, no? and um, and you could you could see that they felt that they had been left behind, and I'm not even sure that they um, that they were there for the all all there for the same reason. You know, some people would say to me, "Look, Catherine, you know, I go down there, and it's not it's not." violent, you're telling people it's violent, but it isn't. And I would, and I would acknowledge that because if you were sympathetic and you went down and, and you were looking for something, some connection, it probably wasn't. Um, but there was, there was a, a leadership and there was, there was a group of people that were leading this um, that were violent that we're trying to overthrow a democratically elected government that um, I believe we're using people and that were exceptionally and extremely racist, white supremacist, homophobic, the amount of transphobia that's been left behind and racism in this city uh, can be felt every single day. So, you know, we, we were abandoned. We were abandoned by the people who we expect to uh, respond um, but I think we were abandoned. I think we, I think we, the abandonment started before the trucks arrived. Mm. I think that our, you know, politically we're, we're polarized um, and we, you know, we are leaving people behind. People are living in poverty in this city, in this country, and that is going to be the result. Whether you agree with them or not, whether you agree with their methods or not, and I certainly don't, um, when you leave people behind, this is the result. Mm. So the abandonment started a long time ago, and it continues, I'm afraid. And I guess one of the one of the very concrete descriptions of abandonment we've heard repeatedly is people's 
frustration um, and bewilderment uh, about the fact that, at least as they saw it, police and bylaw officers, I think many people would, would put it quite simply, weren't doing their job, mm -hmm. that they weren't, um, they weren't enforcing clear infractions of bylaws, whether it be parking or noise or safety bylaws related to open fires, et cetera. Uh, but that they also weren't, that the police weren't intervening and enforcing things that were criminal, including yeah. um, assaults and yeah. threats and, and that sort of thing. And we heard, um, and a lot of people described their efforts to engage with bylaw or police officers, um, sometimes directly in the street, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes by phone, uh, sometimes by going to the police station. And they got a variety of different responses, um, but um, but I, th I think one that came up very often was a variation of, we're waiting for our orders. Um, wondering what your experience was around, I mean, obviously as a, as a politician, you can't instruct the police. <laughs> we know that's uh, verboten. Well, not directly, but uh, you have uh, expectations <laughs> and you can convey that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just wondering what your experience was around that whole mm -hmm. phenomena, um, how much of a concern it was for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I think that's really one of the things that fed directly mm -hmm. into the sense of aban abandonment that people had. Oh, absolutely. I mean, first off, police did not do their jobs when they allowed large vehicles to enter the city. There's no such thing as a, a vehicle having, you know, a constitutional right to protest. <laughs> so, you know, just there. Um, you know, once the, it was here and, you know, people were settled, I'll, I'll give you, an, I mean, two examples. One, you know, my, I mean, I got personally threatened a lot. Um, but one or two were very specific. People had my address. They were threatening to come to my home. Um, and I had to, we, you know, we had to move our daughter out of our home for some time. Um, and, you know, it, it wouldn't have even occurred to me to call police at that time because there was, I never, f never thought that there, they would even respond to that. Hmm. Um, second thing, you know, uh, and, and, I worked very closely with uh, two or three, you know, community police officers who had kind of been assigned to, you know, to work with me if there were specific things like, you know, visiting residents in a certain area, you know, one of them might accompany me uh, into that into that area. I remember once calling one of them, and, I, and this is not, you know, th this is just to give you uh, an idea of the, all of the focus was on Wellington Street. Every Everybody, including police, felt that their responsibility was to Wellington Street, and nobody, nobody uh, considered what was happening in the residential area, even after weeks. And I remember once calling the community police officer that had been assigned to me, and I said, look, I have to go to this building. People are really worried. Would you come with me? And she said, look, I'd love to, but I just got reassigned to the occupation, so I have to go up to Wellington. I said, yeah, but the occupation's happening on Metcalf too. That's where I'm asking you to come. Right, so even in their minds, when they were responding to the occupation, they were, they were responding to Parliament, to what was happening up on the hill on Wellington. I, I'm not certain that even to this day that there's a, a clear recognition of what happened to people during the occupation. I really am not. I've never heard it. I've not heard it from anyone. Mm. Mm -hmm. right. um, maybe just one last question, which is still, I think, something that feeds into this theme of abandonment, and it, and it picks up on something Amonia was asking you about, and again, is, is something, I guess I'm, I'm, we're trying to reflect back to a lot of things we've been hearing. Uh, and it is this uh, lack of information uh, mm -hmm. that, that people had. And, and, and people have frequently referred to the fact that you were one of the only, uh, 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 they got it from Catherine McKenney or they got it by watching the news right. uh, or maybe social media platforms. But, um, but what you might expect in the middle of a full-blown 
human rights crisis yes. of this sort, and, and there's human rights provisions that are relevant here, is people need regular, reliable information so that they can make informed decisions about their rights. <laughs> is it safe for me to go out today? Mm -hmm. Sh you know, should I, uh, should I be sending my, my kids back to school? Whatever yeah. the case may be. Um, and, uh, and you've described th that you were doing the best you could to, to piece that together. Um, and, and maybe you've already answered this to a certain degree in response to, to Monia's question, but um, y I think you were describing you know, that, y that you yourself can't really explain why it was so hard to get that official channel of information flowing. Um, is that something that you've seen before? Uh, or was there something kind of uniquely dysfunctional about the information flow in this context? And, um, uh, and how concerned should we be about that? Like I said, um, you know, the, the city does have a very strong emergency response. It has, you know, the emergency control uh, room. It's it, it, the, um, you know, the, the entire process for responding to emergencies is very clearly laid out. But it is always in response to something that's happened, right? It's, you know, the tornado happens, a flood happens. Mm -hmm. and. And it, you know what to do when you're flooding. You fill sandbags, and you go in, and you, you know, you 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 make sure that you do your best uh, to stop the water flow. Tornado, you know, you go out the minute the, it ends, and you help people, and you you know, pick up live wires, and you know, you know, remove trees from people's homes, etc. Fire, same thing. So. But this was an emergent, a very different emergency, and it was um, an emergency that, again, uh, required um, a coordination of many people, and those people weren't coming together. It mm -hmm. required the coordination of police, the RCMP, federal government, the provincial government, our municipal government, and from my vantage point, and. I certainly wasn't sitting around the table with all of the men who were in charge, um, but from my vantage point, that coordination wasn't happening. You know, nobody was talking to anyone else. You know, it's the you know the the province finally declared an emergency. You know that allowed for you know some change in, in policing, but we'd been calling for that at that point, two and a half weeks. We knew what we needed. We needed, um, you know, we needed the RCMP, the OPP, whomever, to take over policing on the Hill and to deal with what was happening and uh, so that, you know, we could get some security in the residential areas. We had absolutely no, and you know, it's an odd place for me to be calling for excessive police, mm. and that's not what I was mm. saying, but there was no one, there was nothing. If you were, you know, if you needed to get out to do groceries and people were harassing you on the street, it, nobody would respond to that. There was, there was no phone number to call. There was, mm. there was nothing, there was no protection for you. Um, so, you know, in that sense, it's, you know, I think that, Again, it goes back to no coordination, but no coordination from, from anyone. And I think that there is plenty of uh, soul searching to be done um, by many people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know I said that was my last question, That's but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it seems uh, it would seem a lost opportunity to have you here and, and not ask you a bit more of a forward-looking question. Um, and that is if, if I, I imagine you must have some thoughts as to things that could should change or you know, how things should be done differently if something like this was to happen again? I'm yeah. wondering if there's some of that you might want to share. Yeah. Um, well, you know, forward thinking in terms of uh, some, a similar type of event uh, in, in our city. You know, I believe, I believe this, I believe that First off, Wellington Street has got to be, must be turned over to the federal government. Uh, Wellington Street should not be a city street. It should be closed to vehicular traffic. 
uh, and uh, and it should be the responsibility of um, parliamentary police. It should be part of the parliamentary precinct, um, so that you know you have a clear division of you know um, response from the federal government to uh, protest you know, against the federal government, as opposed to what's happening in, in our residential neighborhoods. We're very fortunate, I, you know, in, in this country we have pretty decent access to parliament. We used to have better. There was a time when I remember marching up onto parliament with a, a large pride flag and we were the only, um, we were the only pride in the, the world that could walk up onto its capital grounds, <laughs> right? So we're very fortunate. We live very close. Uh, and, you know, we've got a dense residential neighborhood around. Uh, you know, around our center of government, um, uh, federal government. But you know, the, the the area you know that 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 surrounds um, the prime minister's office uh, and other other parts of the parliamentary precinct should all be one. So Wellington certainly uh, has got to be part of parliamentary precinct. In terms of response, I think we've seen a couple of responses uh, that police certainly, re Ottawa police responded better where they did not allow uh, trucks. That, first off, they paid attention uh, to the intelligence in front of them um, and they did not allow uh, vehicles to stop. They did not allow any uh, anyone to break any traffic rules, bylaw rules, or uh, or any laws, uh, and uh, as a result, we've not had another uh, occupation. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, with respect to um, our municipal government and provincial and federal government, it is um, you know it is key that uh, there's instant coordination. Uh, and that, again, people remember, as you said, that people have a human right to safety, a human right. This was a time, and I'll, I'll end it by saying this. I, I remember this was this struck me almost more than anything. Um, this was a time when, even outdoors, we wore our masks. We were asked to wear masks to keep ourselves safe. But if you were wearing a mask, often that was a sign and you could be harassed. I know people on LRT have been harassed for wearing a mask in that neighborhood, uh, in that red zone. So even though we would look for each other and identify each other with masks as being safe, often we would also take off our masks not to be at risk. You know, so I often remember the look in people's eyes above their mask. Um, it's something I'll never forget, and that, that fear when we would make eye contact but there were times I took off my mask too outside because it made you a target. So we were, you know, we were a neighborhood, and that was a neighborhood, and it, I didn't live there, that was a neighborhood that had been set up in a way that they just couldn't win, and they, they had their, their right to safety to walk outside or to be in their homes taken away from them, and nobody was responding, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, Catherine. I, I, actually, I should check if, if Debbie or Monia had any last questions. No. I have many questions, but I will not. <laughs> we could keep you here for the rest of the afternoon. Yes. But, thank you. Um, uh, no, thank you um, very much for, for giving us your time so generously this afternoon and, uh, and for the role uh, that you were clearly playing uh, during that very difficult time, uh, which we've heard uh, an incredible amount of appreciation for. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So um, we are uh, wrapping up today. Thank uh, thanks very much. Um, and, and we're actually wrapping up uh, mm. our hearings. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to turn it to my, uh, over to my colleague, Debbie, who, who's, who's going to wrap things up for us today. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again this afternoon. We greatly appreciate from hearing from everyone who spoke today, and I mean everyone. And um, I would like to just take the time to give a special shout out to the volunteers and the staff who have been playing an incredible role behind the scenes in making not only this session happen, but so many of the other sessions we've had in person and virtually. I also want to thank our translators in the back for doing an incredible job in making sure that this has been an accessible process for folks from a linguistic standpoint. 
And I will also um, give a special thank you to Le, the Centre Pauline Charon for hosting us today, um, as well as the leadership of the Vanier Community Association, Overbrook Community Association, Vanier BIA for their assistance and support. Again, recognizing that we're having this here in Vanier, and it has been a neighborhood that has often been abandoned, even in this conversation around the occupation. So folks, uh, this is the last one, but this is only the first phase of what is going to be a multi-phase process. Many of you know we are working on a report that we're hoping to launch in early 2023. Um, and so more to come. However, there could be more opportunities for engagement. Please reach out to us on opc-cpo.ca. Um, there could be some more focus groups that might be on the horizon, other opportunities to submit written support, uh, written reports of what you've gone through. So please to keep following us online, we're on social media as well, um, and we can't wait to let you know what the next steps are gonna be once we get that information. So thank you so much.